introduce the moderator for the next panel, panel seven, strategic culture avoiding mirror imaging. But since I'm the moderator for the panel, I'm not going to introduce myself. Joining me today uh, for this discussion are three distinguished panel experts, including Dr. Alistair Ian Johnston from Harvard University, Dr. Andrew Scabell from RAND, and Dr. Dima Adamski from the Interdisciplinary Center Herzliya and Herzliya Israel. We are having some technical difficulties with Dr. Scobell, so I'm going to encourage uh, my other two panelists to not limit, be limited to the 10 minutes we've given them for their discussions. Uh, but we still continue to try and get Dr. Scobell uh, into the forum. So the strategic culture, just ad-libbing here for a second, strategic culture was a, not a doctrine, not a theory really, but it was a theme developed by Rand in 1947 to assess really the possibility that the Soviet Union might use force. What were the triggers that might get the Soviet Union to use force, particularly nuclear capability force? Um, and the strategic culture was sort of a big deal for a long period of time. Lost favor over a number of years until my first guest, Dr. Alistair Ian Johnston, wrote a book called Cultural Realism, Strategic Culture, and Grand Strategy in Chinese History, 1995, which Dr. Johnston's book sort of reactivated the interest in strategic culture. My first guest is Dr. Johnston, the PhD from the University of Michigan. He's a professor in the government department at Harvard University. He has also written on the identity and foreign policy, strategic culture, as I mentioned, as well as arms control and crisis management, mostly with application to the study of China's foreign policy. He's also my college professor at Harvard and probably one of my best college professors. So, Ian, the floor is yours. You're muted. <laughs> Thanks very much, General Hard. Um, to be honest, I had prepared two talks. Uh, one was totally conceptual, actually mostly about the risks and dangers of using strategic culture as an analytic tool. Um, the other uh, talk was on the uh, what types of strategic culture do we observe in China today? And I wasn't sure which one of these to give. I actually preferred the former, um, but I think General Howard prefers the latter, and so I'm doing the latter. Uh, for, for me, strategic culture refers to treating the realm of strategy uh, as having the properties of a culture. That is, in the realm of strategy, what are the taken for granted, internalized, sticky concepts and preferred choices? As you can see from the slides, more specifically for me, strategic uh, analyzing strategic Thank culture okay, sir. fundamentally uh, involves asking, in the realm of strategy, how do relevant groups, politicians, decision makers, strategists within a society answer three questions, what I call the central paradigm of a strategic culture? That is, what answers are internalized or taken for granted? Um, so if you go to slide, okay, so slide three, please. Next slide. So the three questions in a central paradigm, the first one is, how does a group answer the question about the frequency of conflict in human affairs? Is it ubiquitous, highly common? Uh, or is it uncommon and um, aberrant? Next slide. Next slide, please. The uh, second question that central uh, uh, that the um, uh, central paradigm asks is, how zero sum is the nature of disputes? How does this group believe in what, what does this group believe in terms of the uh, zero sum nature of disputes? Are they highly zero sum? where your gain is my loss, my uh, gain is your loss, or is it a variable sum where there's a possibility that both sides uh, actually merge better off as a result of dispute resolution? Third slide, next slide, please. And then the third question is, uh, what is the efficacy of violence? So given the answers to the first two questions, do people or does the group believe that the use of violence is highly efficacious in resolving disputes? 
uh, is almost always ha has to be used to resolve disputes, or at the opposite end, they believe that violence is again an aberrant uh, and actually produces outcomes that uh, are negative. Uh, next slide, please. If the answers to these three questions are at the high end of these dimensions, and this is, we're talking about ideal types here. Uh, next slide, please. Then you could argue, uh, uh, next slide, please. Then you could argue that the, the nature of the strategic culture is, for want of a better term, hyper-militarist. Next slide, please. At the other end, uh, if the answers to these questions are at the low end of the dimensions, uh, next slide, please. Then you could have arguably what might be called a hyper-pacifist strategic culture. Again, this is um, a, uh, a ideal type. Now, I've not conducted a rigorous analysis of the text required to determine what strategic cultures exist or dominate in China today. This is a kind of back of the envelope for heuristic purposes. Actually, you, could, you can remove the slides now if you like. Um, but if we assume that uh, strategic cultures vary uh, somewhere between I these ideal types of hyper-militarist strategic culture on the one hand and the hyper-pacifist strategic culture on the other, what might be the main identifiable strategic cultures inside China today? And I think there are at least three sets of answers to this central paradigm. Uh, the first is a strategic culture that is closest to the hyper-militaristic end uh, or ideal type. This, is, uh, uh, this, this group would believe that uh, conflict is ubiquitous and zero-sum in politics, both internal politics and external politics, uh, that coercion is common and efficacious. Uh, this strategic culture draws from certain Maoist concepts about the ubiquity of conflict, the importance of martial spirit. Uh, it draws from Leninist tradition of a secretive party sensitive to in internal threats, therefore focused on ideological contamination as a primary threat. It draws from a civilizational understanding of international relations. In other words, there are essentialized cultures that vary in their virtue. So Chinese culture, the claim is, is inherently peaceful. Um, and representative voices of this kind of strategic culture you find in some of the, the PLA talking head commentaries you find amongst some of the neo-Maoists uh, you find within the propaganda and internal security systems. Now, the second, strategic culture or answers to these uh, this central paradigm uh, is somewhere further away from this pole of the uh, at the hyper militaristic end and is a more standard rail politique strategic culture it assumes interstate relations are featured by clashes of national interest but also some shared interests in some realms it assumes that if you want peace prepare for war and there is a chinese phrase uh, from uh, classical chinese that is very similar to the latin phrase that uh, uh, Americans cite about if you want peace, prepare for war. Uh, it's focused more on uh, traditional external threats, territorial integrity and sovereignty, not dissimilar in this regard to other formal colonized countries like India. And it's focused on the use of force, uh, both using force and using sovereignty enhancing institutions like the United Nations or institutions that China sets up like the uh, Shanghai, commu uh, Shanghai um, uh, uh, community organization um, uh, and the AIAB uh, as vehicles for defending sovereignty while uh, cooperating where possible. Uh, this strategic culture uh, sees threats as mainly threats of loss, in other words, losses of territory, not threats of contamination or ideological or internal subversion. And representative voices of this kind can be found in parts of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, parts of the uh, PLA, particularly those parts interested in developing crisis management mechanisms with other countries. Uh, you find it in institutions handling information security in China. Third uh, potential uh, strategic culture is closer to the other pole, the pacifist end, though not that close. Uh, and it's a strategic culture that stresses variable sum nature of international relations, roughly equivalent to a liberal internationalist strategic culture. Uh, it uh, believes that economic interdependence stabilizes interstate relations, uh, that multilateral institutions can regulate competition, that economic development requires integration through, uh, though with uh, enhanced Chinese status in the main institutions that regulate economic cooperation. And this strategic culture can be found in parts of the Ministry of Finance, the Foreign Ministry, Department of Commerce, development banks like the China Development Bank, uh, those institutions in charge of engaging with uh, the uh, international um, economic system. 
So this is a very cursory sweep of possible strategic cultures within China. There is overlap, there's blurring at the margins. Um, some people and groups may straddle these boundaries. So I just wanna finish with a comment uh, from my other planned talk that I'm not giving uh, about the risks of strategic culture as an analytical tool for countering mirror imaging. As it's often been used, I think in the past, uh, strategic culture can lead to ethno-national, even racial stereotyping of the other and a kind of blind exceptionalism about oneself or one's own group. It is tempting to engage in very general binary comparisons. Chinese strategic culture is X or American strategic culture is Y. I think the US-China rivalry as it's evolving may be especially primed for this opposite mistake to mirror imaging, where uh, China's ethno-racial exceptionalism meets racial resentment among a significant portion of the US population. And this is a volatile mix that wasn't really part of the US-Soviet rivalry. As my brief analysis above suggests, a binaryization approach to strategic culture misses uh, the following. First, there are likely to be multiple strategic cultures within one society. Second, the dominant strategic culture can change more quickly uh, uh, by a change in who is in power or more slowly through socialization via interactions with the outside world. Third, the dominant strategic culture in, any, uh, in another country may be similar to your own. And indeed, it would be a good exercise, it seems to me, to see if there are similarities between the strategic culture tendencies that I've outlined uh, and tendencies in strategic culture in the United States case as well. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. We, uh, we have Dr. Scobell by phone, and we're working to get Dr. Scobell on video. So, Dimitri, can, you, can you hear me? This is Andrew, Andrew Scobell. Andrew, we can hear you, but we can't see you. So what we're Yeah, gonna... I apologize. I've, I've had tremendous difficulty the, this morning. Thanks to one of your tech guys, I'm able to, to see and hear everybody. But uh, um, maybe it's a third, an unnamed third country that's trying to sabotage this meeting for, for well, the... who knows what reasons. Probably um, China. Or maybe it's just my own incompetence. So what we're going to do, I think, you would normally go third on the panel. We're going to ask Dimitri to go second, and then maybe we can get you in here. Uh, we, maybe we can get you in on video. If not, then we're going to we're going to we'll just do it uh, audio. If that's okay with you. Okay, sure. I mean, my, mine, it follows logically from uh, Professor Johnson, but I'm, I'm happy to, to let the Russians have their say. Okay, well, that's, that's good. We're, um, Thank you. I do have some good news for jo Dr. Johnson. In the, in the question and answer period, I'm going to ask a question that you can reply with your other presentation. So we're good. So it's a, a, a privilege now to be able to introduce a friend of Dr. Johnson's, actually, Dr. Dmitry Adamski. Dr. Adamski is a professor at the School of Government, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the IDC in Herzliya University, Israel, where I have many friends. His research interests include international security, cultural approaches to IR, and American, Russian, Israel, and national security policies. He's written prolifically uh, and I encourage you to look at his uh, bio in our, in our program uh, to see just how prolific an author he is. Dimitri, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, General Hobart, thank you very much. It's really an honor and privilege to be part of this panel and of this uh, group of practitioners and theoreticians, a really remarkable uh, group of scholars and uh, people of practice. Um, it's flattering to be called uh, Professor Johnston's um, uh, friend. I think it's uh, more accurate for their uh, historical reasons to call me his student because actually he was one of the people who introduced me to this whole notion of strategic culture, theory, and concept. So uh, thank you, General, for the kind introduction, and it's really good to be here. What I would like to do in the next uh, eight minutes or so is just to offer you brief sketches about what I consider to be five main traits or five main characteristics of Russian strategic culture. 
as I am taking you through these uh, traits, you will see that each one resides on a slightly different level of strategic activity. Some of them are more relevant to the grand strategy level, and others are probably more relevant to the tactical operational level. My choice selection criteria is mainly to look at or to distill for you from the literature those five traits that loom the largest in the literature and also which explain the recent Russian strategic uh, conduct. But of course, there are much more than the five that I'm going to take you through. So let me start. Trait number one, siege mentality. Uh, I would argue that siege mentality significantly shapes a Russian approach to grand strategy. By siege mentality, we usually uh, mean strategic belief that whatever we are doing, whoever we are, the whole world is against us, and we're doomed to be a besieged fortress and operate under the conditions of encirclement, which aims eventually to undermine and maybe ultimately destroy the regime. In case of Russia, the sources of this mentality are both geographical and political, or they refer to geographical and political history, I'll not talk about those, but I'll more uh, outline for you the possible consequences or implications of siege mentality. First of all, siege mentality uh, accounts for relatively high receptivity of two conspiracy theories and tendency to demonize your competitors. It also accounts for inclination to intelligence over estimates and attribution to the competitors of non-existent intentions, which might result in overreaction. Uh, it also accounts for drawing flawed conclusions from connecting unrelated events. And it's a community, a strategic community, that collectively is in some sort of constant expectation of the approaching catastrophe and fixation on surprise attack. Now, this feeling of their expectation of strike is often coexisting or combined with um, strategic assertiveness. The default qualification of one's own activities in this community is usually as passive or active defense, even if we're looking at what from outside seems as offensive behavior. It's usually an actor, and this is also the case in Russia, that is strongly inclined towards self-help and self-reliance mentality, and the actor that is averse to coalitionary fighting. Like with several other countries with a strong siege mentality, for example, my country, Israel, or Iran, um, in Russia, the complex of strategic inferiority coexists with the feeling of moral superiority and might be accompanied for this reason by the so-called messianic considerations in the national security policy. Trait number one. Trait number two, I would argue that Russian a strategic culture exemplifies what we would call in the literature holistic approach to strategy. Let me elaborate. Holistic or systemic approach to strategy really characterizes Russian way of war and Russian operational art. By holistic approach, what the Russians themselves called complexly or systemly patrod, so holistic approach stands for all embracing view of reality that seeks to grasp the big picture, views issues in different dimensions as interconnected within one generalized frame, and describes every element of strategic reality as being in constant interplay with other segments in frames of one meta system. Cultural cognitive psychologists would qualify holistic thinking style as dialectical, meaning that it recognizes contradictions and also seeks to synthesize opposing propositions. Now, it, it might sound a little bit complicated, but this predilication to holism is prominent throughout the Russian intellectual tradition and cognitive style in literature, in religious philosophy, and in sciences. It has also projected on Russian strategic style and military thought, and it is best exemplified in design, planning, and execution of military operations, for example, in their recent campaign in Syria, where it applied to both the political, strategic, and also operational, tactical aspects of the campaign. Uh, equally, by the way, holistic approach characterizes Russian approach to deterrence, which is more inclined to merge several domains, 
spheres, and also phases of interaction. Trait number three. The third trait relates to style of military innovations and what I would call command and control culture. In Russian organizations, military and civilian alike, power, authority, initiative, and innovations tend to come from the top of the organization. Everything has been traditionally controlled, integrated, and organized hierarchically. This, the authoritarian center has been the primary agent initiating social, economic, and technological change. If we apply it to the military affairs, we will see that historically, most of the Russian major military innovations occurred in the top-down manner when military transformations are managed from the highest level of command in rather a centralized way rather than originating in a bottom-up manner. Russian military tends to innovate by conceptual anticipation, a process when top military theoreticians imagine future war deductively during peacetime, and then, based on this blueprint of their vision of future war, transform the armed forces accordingly. Uh, this culture is disinclined to innovate through battlefield adaptation when lessons learned in a bottom-up manner or inductive manner from the lower levels of command and result in major transformation of the military system during wartime. This is not a characteristic Russian way of innovating. Interestingly, in this particular category, two cultures of command control coexist in Russia on different levels of war. Mission command culture, if I would use the Western term, is expected on the operational level of war where delegation of intellectual authority and creativity uh, under the rubric of operational creativity or what they call in Russian operativne творчество is widely expected. The formal definition of operativne творчество or operational creativity stands for the art of designing, planning, and executing military operations. It is an art and not a science and thus leans, at least in theory, on critical thinking, flexibility, ingenuity, and initiative. When you go, however, from the operational level to the strategic level of war or to the tactical level of war, the command con and control culture and procedures are much more centralized and rigid. Fourth trait relates to dialectics of theory and practice and also some sort of disconnect between words and deeds. Let me elaborate, please. Russian military tradition and Russian military culture historically assumes that theory should drive practice, or at least both should be in some sort of dialectical unity. In other words, scientifically supported theory of victory, using Professor Rosen's term, should guide weapon systems design and procurement, and not the other way around. So theory driving practice. However, this tendency comes with an interesting flip side. Russian intellectual tradition and style of management often manifest disconnect between words and deeds. Uh, a traditional Russian fixation on holistic schemes can make Russians very good at theory, but extremely bad in implementing ideas. Russian non-military scientists and military theoreticians can be very advanced in their conceptualizations, but the system as a whole can be pathologically bad in implementing these, these advanced theories. The gap between theoretical and feasible, however, have ne has never stopped the Russians, and Russian and Soviet military thinking has been usually future-oriented and repeatedly has manifested wishful thinking based on expectations while ignoring current realities and neglecting problems. The dissonance between advanced and sophisticated military theory and the state's actual ability to implement it, which is a traditional Russian ill or traditional ill of the Russian uh, uh, strategic military management, uh, also has its pros and cons. Since frames of objective reality and feasibility considerations don't necessarily restrict conceptual military knowledge development and strategic imagination, Russians have often, over the history, uh, thought outside of the box about the emerging character of war and came up with innovative and creative theories of victory. 
though usually uh, unrealistic and unfeasible at home, their intellectual products have been rather competitive and outdone in sophistication the analogs in other wealthier and more practical countries and cultures. And finally, let me conclude with their uh, fifth uh, trait or characteristics, characteristic that refers to their proportion of material and moral factors in the traditional Russian theory of victory. Russian culture of war tends to emphasize moral, psychological, cognitive factors over material technological ones. All the Russian strategy, generalship, and operations over history have appreciated technological aspects of war. They relied heavily on the soft aspect of strategy to make up for traditional Russian technological material inferiority. This was not a simplistic approach merely about outnumbering the enemy with expandable cannon fodder, but a peculiar metaphysics, if you wish, about overcoming the enemy qualitatively morally. Now, when we go to the Russian non-material military edge, it usually, in the Russian literature, has three expressions. It's a higher level of one's stratagem and theory of victory, under the terms of military cunningness and operational creativity. It's an emphasis on moral superiority and fighting for a higher and just cause as the main sources of soldiers' motivation and fighting spirit, and also a higher level of moral psychological fortitude of the individual serviceman or individual soldier and of the whole formation to ensure stamina, bravery, and unit cohesion. In short, and in sum, according to the Russian strategic belief, battles are won by man, by the spiritual and psychological power of the servicemen, by a higher level of endurance in the face of combat hardships, in other words, about outfighting by outsuffering and outlasting the enemy, and not by machines, technology, or other material factors. With the transformation of warfare during or under different revolution in military, revolutions in military affairs, and notwithstanding contemporary or historical technological modernizations, Russian armed forces never became technocentric, and in contrast, for example, to the United States military, where the theory of victory is often conditioned by the American strategic culture, they tend to lean on sophisticated machines, something that we observe in the United States and less so in the case of Russia. Uh, I will probably stop here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dmitry. Uh, Andrew, I'm always happy to run into you and see you uh, around the world, but I'm really, really happy to see your face now that we, we, we <laughs> corrected these technical deficiencies. So our next uh, and final panelist is Dr. Andrew Scobell senior political scientist at the RAND Corporation. His most recent publication is very topical. Chairman Xi re remakes the PLA. Uh, that's at National Defense University Press in 2019. I could go on with this uh, amazing bio, but I would like to say that Dr. Scobell was born in Hong Kong, and he makes so many re regular research trips to China, I think they were thinking about asking him if he wanted citizenship. So, Dr. Scobell, the uh, floor is yours. You can uh, take about 10 minutes. I gave more time to your colleagues, so floor is yours, sir. Thank you, General Howard. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be on such a, a panel with such distinguished uh, fellow panelists and to uh, talk about one of, one of my pet rocks, uh, strategic culture. At the same time, it's uh, not easy uh, to be on a panel um, following uh, the person who, who pioneered the rigorous study of uh, strategic culture with a focus on China and gave it uh, academic credibility, uh, to be you know, uh, very, uh, very honest. I'm, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, uh, I hope I don't distort uh, Ian's uh, uh, findings, he can always correct me uh, online or, or, or offline uh, later on. Uh, but uh, you know, Ian's research, uh, again, looking looking at the at the Ming Dynasty, identified two strands 
of uh, Chinese uh, strategic culture, a Confucian mention uh, one, and a real politic uh, uh, parabellum strand. And he's, he's actually touched on those in, in his presentation. So the, the former uh, being a defensive-minded, uh, non-expansionist, um, uh, pacifistic uh, uh, strand, and the uh, latter being a uh, more uh, you know, real, realist uh, uh, one where force is seen as a very central uh, part, uh, critical part of statecraft and what one that should uh, should not be uh, uh, sh should not be pushed uh, to the to the side. In uh, in uh, in his book on str on strategic culture in the uh, in the Ming Dynasty, Ian uh, concludes that uh, the uh, it's the parabellum only the parabellum strand is operative, and the Confucian mention one is. Is pretty much used uh, for only for symbolic discourse. My own research uh, focused on on uh, post forty nine China suggests that both of these str strands exist. Um, so I agree. Uh, I think that's there are multiple strands of Chinese strategic uh, strategic uh, culture, but I find that both strands are active and influential. And indeed, they act, uh, interact dialectically, resulting in what I call a Chinese cult of defense. And this uh, cult of defense has a psychological, cultural impact, which leads uh, Chinese political and military leaders to rationalize virtually any uh, military action as defensive, even when most objective observers would uh, would conclude uh, that, that otherwise, and this would uh, this goes to uh, include uh, preemptive strikes, which China uh, Chinese leaders uh, would uh, consider uh, defensive um, under under most most circumstances. So, what are the what are the uh, policy implications of, of China's cult of defense? I'd just like to highlight three of them. I think first, uh, the cult of defense ex exacerbates uh, the security dilemma, meaning that uh, Beijing uh, sees just about anything the United States does as offensive, threatening, and all about China. A second uh, implication of this uh, cult of defense uh, elevates uh, the escalation potential in a, a crisis or war situation, because Beijing tends to assume the worst about U.S. intentions. And at the same time, uh, uh, my, my research suggests that uh, Chinese um, analysts and leaders are quite confident about, uh, overly confident, I should say, about their ability to manage crises and control escalation. And so that's that's a worry that's a worrisome uh, mix. Thirdly, uh, points one and two are further accentuated in the current uh, geopolitical climate of great power uh, competition and confrontation. So this is uh, um, all all of this uh, makes for an incendiary and volatile mix. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't mean, however, that the U.S. and China are destined for war or uh, cooperation. Excuse me on issues of mutual concern uh, is not possible. But it does make these uh, uh, the situation we face in 2021 um, between the U.S. and China especially challenging. And uh, I would just uh, mention uh, underscore uh, some of Ian's points. Uh, I think the danger here is on stereo is is part of this is, is stereotyping and othering and it it to the best of my knowledge is not just occurring in China it's also occurring in the United States. Thank you. Thank you.
Andrew, and thank you, panelists. Uh, we have some questions, but since I'm the moderator, I'm going to ask my question first. And I think I know the answer from at least two of our panelists, but maybe, Dimitri, I don't know yours. But I've often thought that strategic culture could be used uh, as a predictor of behavior, and particularly when it comes to the use of force, and not just by China, but I've written about North Korea, and I've written about Iran, and even Al-Qaeda. Uh, I get a lot of pushback when I say this, so I'm curious to know what panelists uh, would think about using strategic culture as a predictor, and particularly a predictor of the use of force. So Ian, I think I know what your answer is going to be, but I'd like to hear it anyway. So thank you. <laughs> um. <clears throat> I think that the, the safest answer is that uh, the dominant strategic culture at any particular point in time, uh, two points actually, may uh, be useful in explaining a limited range of behavior. In other words, it doesn't necessarily determine a specific outcome. Uh, if you view, for example, the world as highly zero sum, highly conflictual, uh, where force is efficacious, uh, it, it means that presumably the use of coercion will in a sense be the first tool to be used in resolving disputes, but it doesn't necessarily predict the way in which that tool will be used offensively, defensively, um, uh, you know, what kinds of targets, et cetera, would be. Um, th there may be sub-strategic cultures uh, at an operational level, for example, or we'll call them operational cultures, where you could derive more specific point predictions about uh, specific kinds of operational tendencies. But I don't rule out the possibility, obviously, that, um, that uh, a range of options are a priori ruled out. That's basically what strategic cultures do, uh, right? They, they a priori rule out certain uh, strategies and certain responses, uh, depending on the content of the strategic culture. It may rule out violent responses. It may rule out uh, nonviolent responses. Um, but then within the remaining options, then I think you probably have to go to a lower level of perhaps operational culture to determine more specific um, expressions of, of force. Now, it's also possible that there may be a disconnect between the dominant strategic culture and actual behavior because of the inefficiencies, inefficiencies of policy implementation. In other words, it may be that there are operational um, standard operating procedures, for example, that in a sense obstruct or pervert uh, the, uh, uh, the preferences of the dominant strategic culture, or there may be domestic political opposition that uh, among uh, you know, key uh, constituencies in the population at large, there may be a resistance to support certain kinds of policy options that derive from the dominant strategic culture. So I, I, I'm not a determinist in the sense that a particular strategic culture leads to a specific set of op uh, operational outcomes. Um, but I think what strategic culture does is it, it ex ante or a priori rules out certain options um, uh, 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 demonstrates a preference for other options, um, and it's within those boundaries that you can then um, make predictions about a, a range of possible behaviors. Uh, excellent answer, particularly when we think about present security environment where it's, it's the other options short of warfare that are important. Dimitri? Um, your comments, please. Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Gerald. Um, I think I will echo Professor Johnston in a sense that I don't want to sound deterministic, but um, to me, as you said, the predictive power of um, strategic culture as a framework and lenses to analyze the competitors is in ability to better grasp the otherness of strategic other. Uh, Professor Johnston and Professor Scobell were talking about mirror imaging and projecting your own image on the other. So I can see in three particular spheres where it can be useful. 
on the strategic level, um, I think it can flesh out counterintuitive strategic phobias of the other side. Something that is really puzzling and something that we, watchers of particular object of interest, wouldn't qualify as threatening. So if we are viewing the world through the lenses of a given actor, we can come up with some threat perceptions that are counterintuitive uh, to us. On the operational level, I think my presentation briefly touched on that. I think cultural explanations can decipher and make some predictions about style of war. They can explain or enable to better hypothesize what are the more likely inclinations of prospective military innovations. And also, as part of it, they can enable us to think more systematically or to hypothesize more systematically about a future theory of victory of a given actor. Or they can help us to decipher and explain, if we look at the cultural or ideational sources, a uh, theory of victory that we are observing as of now. That's point number two. And point number three, I will echo again Professor Johnston, I think strategic cultural theory, especially in its current uh, um, uh, state of the discipline, can help us to disaggregate the big monolithic strategic culture into their subcultures, if you wish, or cultures of particular services or cultures of particular institutions within broader strategic community. And if we are attentive and accurate enough, we can also, at least in theory, try to spot their coexistence or dynamic within one strategic community of different strategic cultures or subcultures, which can help us to understand better intra and inter service competitions for resources, for the retention of the political leadership, even for the spheres of responsibility or areas of responsibility and their uh, potential future theory of uh, victory. So um, I wouldn't be deterministic in attributing too much to strategic culture theory, but I think it's tremendously useful analytical framework to uh, try explaining the otherness of strategic other. Thank you. Andrew, what's your take on the question? Okay. Um, well, I would uh, tend to concur with uh, what uh, uh, pretty much uh, er almost everything uh, that uh, my fellow uh, panelists have said. I think uh, strategic culture uh, is not is not predictive, but it provides this a useful framework, and it suggests propensities um, of actors. And but I think it's it's contextual, contextual it's situational, and uh, that it, uh, it it depends on you know who uh, or what other uh, country uh, the. Uh, the the leaders of uh, of say China are confronting or Russia or, or whatever that is. So, um, I've uh, I've coined, uh, coined I've argued that there's when we when we're applying this rubric uh, of uh, conception of strategic culture, we need to talk about two faces of strategic culture. The first face be, being what uh, the political and military leaders of a specific country believe is their own strategic culture. Uh, and then the second face being what those leaders believe is the strategic culture of their adversary or potential, ad or, or, or potential adversary. And that really influences how they are likely, likely to act and how they are likely to see what their, uh, interpret what their uh, adversary does uh, or doesn't do. And, and so this is, uh, I think there's, there, the both of these faces are important uh, to factor in, and here, um, you know, we, both uh, the other speakers have, have talked about uh, mirror imaging. Here, um, you know, for reasons, you know, for, for reasons that, that I think are, are pretty obvious, uh, there isn't. I, I tend to agree that mirror imaging is not is not going on because, you know, in the case of the Chinese, they see the U.S. As different culturally and with a different strategic tradition, and likewise, the U.S. Uh, tends to see China as as being different, having a different strategic tradition. But what I do think happens 
in a crisis situation or a wartime situation is mirror imaging of rationality. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, Americans look at China, for example, and if what China does, does doesn't comport uh, with US logic, then uh, they tend to almost automatically draw one of two conclusions. Either uh, the Chinese are crazy, irrational, but that tends to happen only if a country is much weaker. So here, North Korea. If North Korea does something that doesn't make, uh, that's, uh, that, that uh, catches the US uh, by surprise, then we, we judge them, uh, label them irrational or crazy. But the second, uh, the second conclusion, and this tends to uh, go with a, a country uh, which is much more powerful, um, uh, that is uh, like China, that what China what China is doing is is practicing deception, and, and so th there's this immediate conclusion uh, that the Chinese are up to something, and that's actually the way China China tends to Chinese leaders tend to look at the United States if they don't understand uh, if they're immediately suspicious of whatever the U.S. does because they think there's some ul ulterior uh, or a motive or or deceptive practice. Uh, going on here. So it's not um, mirror imaging, it's mirror imaging of rationality. That's the challenge. Thank you. I do have a question from the audience and it's uh, directed at Dr. Scovell, but all of you could have an opportunity to uh, answer. So the question is, um, well, we have more questions, hold on here. Well, this one is for uh, Dr. Adamski. Do you think that Russia's younger generation and democratic opposition could produce shifts in Russia's strategic culture? And if so, in what ways? Dr. Adamski. Mm, thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know, but I don't think so. I see it more unlikely rather than likely. First of all, if we believe in the existence of such thing as dominant strategic culture, it relates more to their norms, values, and beliefs about efficacy in the questions of peace and war. So I would argue that even if you are coming from the democratic um, opposition today, when it comes to the pure professional business of blood and iron, you know, like pure military affairs, if I confine myself to this scope of analysis, I don't think we would expect significant change when it comes to the style of war, style of military operations, and style of military innovations. I'm arguing in such a confidence for one very simple reason. Uh, history is on my part. Uh, historically, we observed much more continuity than changed between the Tsarist, Soviet, and post-Soviet Russia when it comes to their style of military affairs. So whether you are Tsarist, communist, or post-communist, more continuity than change is uh, on display. That's number one. Number two, if you are referring less to their pure military professional level, but referring more to their higher levels of strategy already bordering on ideology, there are people in the Russian armed forces who are on the payroll to make sure that you are uh, more about continuity than about the change. About two years ago, Russian general staff and Ministry of Defense reintroduced the main military political directorate uh, the organ that was responsible for political officers and commissars historically, something that never uh, disappeared, for example, in PLA, and I'm sure my colleague can talk more about it. So this particular organ, grosso modo, or at the nutshell, is responsible for preservation of the overall set of values, norms, and traditions that are there in today's Russia when it comes to military and strategic affairs. So um, I think these two factors probably um, incline me towards their negative answer. No, I don't think uh, we uh, uh, should expect any uh, significant uh, change. There are some changes in Russian military culture, specifically in the culture of command and control, 
in specifically the emergence of mission command culture. But again, this is within the broader context of uh, Russian strategic culture. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is for Dr. Scobell. His question is, historically, China was isolationist and was comfortable espousing living by some norms in international relations, albeit norms they crafted. Has this ancient strategic culture, in effect, died in China? And I guess the first part would be, do you agree with the question or the statement in the question? And uh, Ian would probably let you have a crack at this, too, if you wanted. So, Dr. Scobell, your answer, sir. When we're, uh, when we're talking about strategic culture, I think the assumption is that they're enduring. Um, doesn't mean they last forever, uh, but they're, uh, uh, they, they tend to have staying power. Um, and it would take, uh, takes time or, or dramatic, uh, dramatic events uh, like defeat in war um, uh, to, to change it. Um, I think there, there's certainly, uh, there's certainly a long continuity in, in Chinese uh, strategic thought, um, not, not to over, uh, over you, you can, I think you can over exaggerate it, but China, how long Chinese uh, civilization has been around, one, one, can, one can quibble, um, whether it's 5,000 years or 4,000 years, but it's been around for a long time. And so that continuity uh, it continue, uh, uh, continues to, to have influence and you know, not, to be, not to be trite, but I think it manifests itself in, in some ways uh, at a very basic level in what some people call the middle kingdom complex, where you know, China thinks of itself as being a very, a very ancient and, and, pow and powerful country that is trying, uh, trying to reassert that it's uh, or reclaim its rightful place on the, on the world stage. And to, uh, to, to borrow a term that's been popular in the United States, you know, Xi Jinping's goal of, uh, or China dream is, you know, to make China great again. And so this, uh, this, uh, these, this, this, uh, I think highlights uh, significant elements of continuity, if nowhere else uh, than in the, the uh, psychological and, and cultural mindset of Chinese leaders and indeed the Chinese people. Over. Yeah, I, I, um, I guess, I guess I'd want to unpack the whole the premise, of the question that there is historically China has been um, isolationist. You know, Chinese history is pretty long, uh, and there's an awful lot of variation in the interactions between the various political entities that claimed to be ruling um, much of the of the of what we now call uh, China. Of course, it wasn't called China in those days. Um, you know, ranging from the Warring States period, where you had multiple, uh, more or less independent, maybe even quasi-sovereign states interacting in ways that we would identify and recognize in in, in European politics, for example, uh, periods of intense um, interaction with uh, peoples and entities and cultures and economies outside of the traditional scope of of uh, Chinese territory. Uh, in the Tang uh, Dynasty period, for example, uh, periods of rigorous trade all around East Asia, um, uh, periods of um, uh, weakness vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the West, uh, interacting uh, with the West. So there are these multiple traditions on which uh, contemporary Chinese leaders could draw to say, you know, our history tells us the following. Chinese history could tell you several different lessons about how to deal with external threats. So the interesting question is, which of these traditions do Chinese uh, leaders today draw on more frequently to, in a sense, tell them about how to understand the environment in which they're in? Um, and one of those still very powerful traditions is not actually the Middle Kingdom, so-called Middle Kingdom uh, tradition. Um, which in historical reality only existed for a relatively short period where, where, where China was the center of this tribute um, uh, relationship that basically lasted in the Ming and the Qing, that was about it. Um, 
But what the leaders really tend to draw on more frequently is uh, the, hun the hundred years after the uh, British uh, defeated China during the Opium Wars uh, in the 1840s uh, and the so-called center of humiliation. I think if you were to ask what historical lessons are Chinese leaders more likely to apply to understand their place in the co contemporary international system, the goals that, uh, that China needs to achieve in order to thrive and survive and um, perhaps dominate certainly in East Asia uh, in the contemporary international system, they'll draw on the century of humiliation and modern Chinese nationalism. Um, I don't think their their first uh, the their, their first uh, move is to draw on the Warring States period or draw on the Ming Qing period or draw on the Tang period. Uh, I think it's largely to draw on the um, to some degree imagined uh, to some degree real uh, experience at the hands of uh, foreign imperialism in the in the uh, from the 1840s to the 1940s. Thank you, Ian. We have a couple more questions, and I'm not sure we're going to have time for all of them. But it, now I'd like to have sort of for you to put your China and Russia hats on. And the question is for the panel: How do do, do Russian policy wonks, uh, sort of like me, do they consider the United States as a strategic culture, or are they worried about it, or do they study it? And from your perspective, uh, do they? And I'll start with uh, Dimitri, start with you. Yes, thank you. Um, yes and yes. Um, they do explore US strategic culture. Uh, by the way, interestingly, this is basically the type of work that I'm doing right now. Uh, slowly but steadily, the concept of strategic culture is migrating from the Western strategic studies literature into Russian IR literature and strategic studies uh, discourse. So they even start um, employing this framework of analysis to explain their own strategic behavior, strategic behaviors of others, but specifically to analyze US strategic culture. It is full with misperceptions, um, I would say, um, projecting their strategic self on the United States. But still, I think they have a pretty accurate view of um, this uh, uh, subject matter as a theory and also the way how they are analyzing the United States. What is interesting though, they, many of them, I mean, there is a significant group of experts within Russian strategic community that believes that as part of the currently ongoing and long lasting informational struggle or informational war between the United States and Russia, the United States is deliberately trying to change and transform Russian strategic culture. Moreover, it is quite often presented in their discourse as an ultimate goal of the United States strategic, the American strategic community, which can enable the United States to attain its strategic and operational goals without employing kinetic force. Um, so this is the second aspect. I will stop here. Thank you. We have about two more in, in, minutes. Andrew, I think you've actually, actually also already partially answered this question, but go ahead and give it another shot. So wasn't this question about Russia, though? No, it was about both China and Russia. The, OK. Um, yeah, I, the, the one. <laughs> Countries, not, that's not surprising. The country that China pays most attention to uh, uh, is is the United States, and uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a tremendous reverence uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, high respect for the U.S. Uh, military, but the, the the tendency is to see, and this uh, um, builds on what, what uh, uh, th there's a parallel or a similarity here with with uh, what Russian strategic culture has described uh, by, by Dmitry. Um, this assumption that the United States is very much uh, is strategic culture is highly uh, emphasizes um, leveraging technology, and uh, so the the uh, the goal two pronged goal of of the the PLA and modernization is uh, you know to uh, 
strengthen its own technology in areas like artificial intelligence and so on, so it's able to compete uh, uh, more, at, better compete with the United States, but also leverage China's perceived advantages. And that is, um, that is uh, this uh, strategic, uh, long tradition uh, of strategic thought, which unlike, you know, on the, uh, un unlike at the grand strategic level, I think uh, Ian's right that it's the century of humiliation uh, that's, that's most important here. But if you're looking at Chinese uh, military uh, op thinking in, at the operational level, they go. Uh, they do study their own the, the history, of the, uh, the military history of the PLA, the campaign history of the PLA. But they go back thousands of years. They do go back to the Warring State uh, State period and ancient and in ancient China uh, to derive lessons and insights from campaigns and battles that were fought uh, thousands thousands of years ago. Over. Ian, we're going to let you take us out. Do the Chinese uh, consider the United States as a strategic culture, and do they study it? Right. So very quickly, because I know our time is up. The term strategic culture uh, in China was first adopted by General Li Jijun in the late 90s, um, basically directly borrowing from, without acknowledging, borrowing from uh, uh, Western uh, work on strategic culture. Um, it's been used primarily to talk about China's strategic culture, and it's been used in this regard to create a certain mythical construct about China as inherently peaceful, um, uh, inherently defensive, uh, using Sunzi, for example, as a source of uh, uh, applications to deterrence theory in the in the nuclear era, et cetera. Uh, designed essentially to create this notion, um, as I said, which is slight uh, is is historically mythical about China as an inherently peaceful country, um, sort of engaging kind of uh, self, um, uh, if similar to every other country, a, a notion of exceptionalism uh, that is inherently virtuous. And you know we see this in the way uh, Americans talk about exceptionalism as well. But uh, General Lee Jijun was the person who really coined or used the term uh, first in the PLA, as I said, largely to describe um, uh, Chinese own traditions. There are some uh, uses of, of kind of cultural categories when the Chinese analyze the United States. Uh, they talk about the United States as having a hegemonic uh, approach to international relations, as uh, sometimes they'll refer to Americans as having a missionary culture that uh, is part of the explanation for uh, uh, American export of, of ideology. Um, uh, and and most recently, in the in the wake of the anti uh, Chinese uh, racism in the in the COVID uh, period in the United States, some Chinese are now referring to the United States as having kind of uh, deeply ingrained racialist uh, tendencies. Uh, sometimes they will also use strategic culture in analyzing Japan. Uh, there's you know debates within the PLA about this, but oftentimes you will get a kind of a knee jerk reaction, which is oh yeah, the Japanese have a militaristic culture. That inheres in 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 the traditions of of uh, Japanese um, thought and and history. Um, so I think they use the term strategic culture. I think they use it the, the way that I was trying to warn against using it, namely engaging in uh, stereotypes about self and other. Um, and there is a risk there, as there is a risk in the United States of uh, seeing the other as so different. Uh, that this then creates, you know, drawing on social psychology, social identity theory, uh, seeing the other as so different uh, that this creates a perception of the other as inherently threatening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, gentlemen, all three of you. Did I mean just? It, it, this has been a great panel. Uh, I know you're very busy, uh, Ian and Andrew. I've known you for a long time. Dimitri, I've met a new friend today, so. Uh, Hope you all can come back and support us in the future. Thanks again for participating today. Thank you. We are now uh, ready for a break. Uh, we went a little over in the last panel. Uh, I'll take responsibility for that. But if you could be back in your seats at 1115, uh, we'd be ready for the next panel. Thank you.